Hey everyone, welcome to the Essential Creative Fireside Chat Series. I'm here with Deesha Henfield tonight. Deesha, how are you? I'm great, how are you? I'm really good. I'm really excited to get to talk with you tonight. So the question everyone loves when I ask them, tell us about yourself. <laughs> um, well, my name is Deesha Henfield and I am a mother of two. I'm an author, I'm a veteran. Um, I also am, I, I do some guest speaking here and there. And um, ultimately, I am a child of God and proud of it. <laughs> amen, amen. All right. When I look down, just so everyone watching this knows, and so you know, Disha, I'm making notes for myself, not looking at a phone or anything. Um, I write things down or else I interrupt a lot. <laughs> so, um, all right. So I forgot that you were a veteran. Thank you for your service. I know um, right now I work in manufacturing with the submarine supply chain as my day job. So I know right now just uh, there's a lot of people under stress and then a lot of veterans who are really praying for people. So as yeah. children of God and women who are prayer warriors, I know that that's something big on, on our hearts right now. Oh, so definitely. yeah. So if you're watching this in the future, we are um, at the part of the world where Russia and Ukraine are having some um, war issues. And so we are here, thankfully, in the safety of America and able to talk with each other. And so we don't take that lightly tonight. Let's start with, so I met Disha because of purpose in the, in my, the purpose in my pain and never can seem to say it right. Disha is another co-author there. And so Disha, tell us a little bit about I Am and your, your section of the book. Um, well, I Am was basically um, birthed out of things that I say to myself. I had to grow into knowing who I am after um, dealing with life issues. So I speak I am statements to myself and positive I am statements. So the more positivity you pour into yourself, the more you can pour out to other people. And so that's what my chapter of the book is about. It's mainly, it tells my story and I speak about three specific instances in my life because really the whole chapter is really about forgiveness and learning how to forgive others and forgive yourself and so the the I am statements help you with that as you grow into knowledge of yourself I love that and do you do the affirmations where they come from a biblical standpoint or is it I am like in general um nothing wrong with either way just curious like how you've done them for yourself um, I started out basically for myself, but I also do them um, with biblical principles involved, I guess, because like people say, I am a child of God. I am the child of the king. You know, I am I am the head and not the tail, things like that. So, yeah, so it, and it comes from I am worthy. I am beautiful. I am more than enough, like the same. So it comes okay. from God. Perfect. I love that. I think sometimes we can get so holy, we forget that not everything has to trace exactly back to scripture. But then I love when there is that way, like, um, I'm a big Jen Sincero fan. And mm -hmm. even though she's like creator and stuff like that, you can take everything that she says and bring it back to scripture and yeah. find a scripture that aligns with it. And I really love like taking those kind of things and being able to match them up. Um, something you talked about in your chapter is wearing masks. And there's a quote I have here. Um, Andre Bartholomew, this was my first speech ever. I use this quote and it's always been a favorite one. It says, we all wear masks and the time comes when we cannot remove them without removing some of our own skin. Mm. As you were learning how to come out of masks without giving away the, the chapter, because obviously we want people to buy the book to read it. But um, as you were coming out and, and you know, pulling your mask off, how did that feel? Did you feel the pain of like, like I talks about, we're removing our own skin? Well, I think when you are removing the mask, if you've had it on for an extended period of time, much like myself, you have no choice but to remove some of the layers of your skin. So I agree with that. Yeah. When you're wearing a mask, you're actually, you're not, you're more than disguising yourself, but you're also losing yourself in the, in the identity of the mask that you are wearing. So if, when it comes to the time for you to begin to peel it away, you do have to pull off some of the layers because you have dead skin that, okay. that has grown there. So it has to be scrubbed off as well in order for you to become a new. 
I love that analogy because you're right. Like he talks about it peeling that layer off. But when you think about like a facial mask, right? We we yeah. put the makeup on and we let it soak it or not the makeup, but the, like the clay or something, yeah. let it soak for a little bit. And the whole point is to clear those dead skin cells away. So, yeah. and I do love that when you are wearing a mask, you are like the whole point of it is to assume another identity. So that's yeah. a great point about how you lose some of yourself in that. Mm-hmm. Um, I had never really thought of it that way. So that was really yeah. powerful. Um. I noticed that as I was reading, we're both come from a background of being single moms. How old were you when you had your daughter, um, daughter or son? Well, um, my son is my first child. I had my okay. son when I was 19 years old. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah my oldest actually, was born. I had, actually, I hadn't even turned 19 yet. He was born in May. I turned 19 in June. Okay. So you're just like <laughs> a year ahead of me. My daughter was born in March and I turned 18 in August. Okay. So she was born like she was at my graduation is in my senior picture with me. <laughs> okay. It's like, so such a baby, although back then I thought I knew it all. Um, has that shaped who you are a bit being a teen mom or not so much because of being like more toward the 18, 19 time for like age frame? Well, I, I, I think it shaped me and that it helped me to make different decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up in my family. My mother, even though she had some jobs, sometimes she also, I I grew up as a welfare child. So, you know, public assistance, but she did have jobs. I don't want to take anything away from her as a person, because she did work. She worked for the city before. She had other types of jobs. But for the most part, off and on, it was public assistance. And then when I had my son, it was like, I want something different. I didn't want to be a statistic. And so that was where the decision came from to join the military because okay. that was how I was going to get my foot out of Philadelphia, jump into a new world and maybe start something fresh, break some generational curses by doing something different with my life. I, you know, it's interesting that you say that because that was my whole thing. My whole thing, a lot of what I felt over the last few years of feeling like a failure for having to move back in with my parents um, when I was 38, Mm -hmm. I've been on my own since I was 12, 12, 13, when I went into the state system as a foster child. And so moving back in at 38 was like the end of the world for me because I was always like, I'm not going to be a statistic. I'm not going to be. And so even though I became a mother at at 17 turning 18, I never took welfare. Like, like, and not just to be clear with my words, because we are in a time today where I understand people needing it. For yeah. me, I did not want to go on it. I wanted to not be a statistic of you had a child young. And so it's interesting that you said those same words because I was like so determined. And then when I got divorced, you know, we got married at 20, I got divorced at 30. I was like, I won't be a statistic. And sure enough, I worked really hard, did it. And then here I was at 38 and it was like, I'm moving back home. I officially have fallen in with the statistics. You know, I was like, but what is this? Going home. I, you know, I fun. needed it for the healing. It's, it's someday I'll write about that. But yeah, I do see, and you know how we talk about the purpose of my pain. I do see now where it was, but it was that feeling that I've had to work through over the last six years of understanding like, it wasn't a failure. It's been a reset and one that was very much needed because I wouldn't be who I am without that. Mm-hmm. So for you with, with that drive to not be a statistic, how, how did that affect your life? Do you think? Cause I know it can affect it in a great way, or it can have some negative effects where we're so driven that we almost like never see the forest for the trees kind of thing. Well, I don't think it was that I was so driven. I, I mean, okay. I had to go along with life in, in the process. A lot of other things happened. One of okay. the things I talk about forgiving in my book is something that happened to me in the military. Nobody knew yes. about it. And they're not knowing until they read this in here. And they really still don't know. They only get a glimpse of okay. it. You know? um, but uh, okay. I think that it, it just motivated me more. I've always been a motivated kind of person. Um, so going into the military and then my son, eventually, you know, when you go to the military, you have to let go of your children yeah. while you're at boot camp. So they would have to sign them over to somebody and all that. So after that, then he was able to come with me. And I, I did, I, don't, I will, have, will say I had support. Like my grandmother, you know, when I would have to go out to see it, I was in the Navy. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sometimes she would come down and, 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 and sometimes I would have to send him back home for a little bit. And he was able to go to my mother's or to a family member at that time. But even with that, 
my whole goal, I was always working for my son. Gotcha. It was money coming home. When he wasn't with me, money coming home for my son. When he was with me, I'm working to get whatever I need cause for my son. You know what I mean? Pouring into my son because I want him to be different. I want him to, even though I was I was a single mom at that time, I wasn't married. So, you know, still try, a woman trying to raise a, a young man. But, you know, so I was, I was, I'll say I was driven, but I wasn't too driven because in the military, you still had to go by what they say. You know, you only can do but so much. This is true. Um, this is true. <laughs> I was a Navy wife. I I, oh, okay. I went through I went the route of going in via someone else. So okay. We lasted okay. ten years. His whole enlistment, we were married. But yeah. um, so share with me. I know that you write poetry as well. Yeah. I, or I'm learning that you write poetry. Talk to me about the kind of poetry you write, and you know, do you have a book available that that people can buy? Um, help us get to know you as a poet a little better. Well, my poetry is is life centered. So I could be having a conversation with you. This is how God uses, this is how God works through me. I could be having a conversation with you and you might mention something and, and, and all of a sudden you'll just see me start writing and I'll be writing a poem about whatever it is that you just told me about. Um, um, one, I have to write for specific things. Like if somebody say, can you write such and such? It's harder for me. Um, I strictly go off of feeling an emotion and what is placed in me in that moment. Um, my poems that are in, I did my first book is Inner Sanctum, Life, Love, and Poetry. And um, in this book is poems that I have written over the years. But I have, and, and I will say, I, I've actually sat in depression for easily 25 years. And, and that's why there was the mask. And, and, and people, the average person would think I'm the most happy, go lucky, positive person you ever want to meet. And didn't know that I was literally the most depressed, dark person <laughs> outside of being around people. So um, in that, a lot of the poems that I have written, um, they, they, they might seem somewhat dark and somewhat sad. Um, but also in my book, there is also um, poems about God. There's a lot of love in there. Uh, you know, my best poems come from falling in love and falling out of love. <laughs> Amen. It's great to meet another Christian that's like that. Um, a lot of my poems come from dark places or like about abuse, about falling in or out of love. And there's actually a poem when I wrote my book, I had included, it's it's like called, Oh, How I Love You or something like that. And mm -hmm. I included it like just so you could see how bad I suck when I try to like do a praise. Oh God, you're so wonderful. I can praise him like this. Like if we started prayer, you know, in my own time, but boy, when I try to write a poem, like a, you know, like a day David kind of psalm, mm -hmm. girl, stay in your lane. <laughs> like, yeah. like I learn I'm better about things that are more abstract or about the brokenhearted. And now, so it's interesting. I I've never suffered um, depression. I've had like maybe seasonal, I, you know, maybe I think mm -hmm. if I got real honest with myself, there might be a seasonal thing. Cause I notice each time that like it goes into the winter, I yeah. tend to get like a real mood. Um, mm -hmm. But I know with depression, like, you know, one of my clients actually struggles with bipolar and she shares with me that you can still be happy mm -hmm. but yet depressed and so is that when you're talking about like you know people know you as happy go lucky but then it's more of like an inner feeling um yeah. with that so with your poetry and it, it's speaking out of that how has that changed with now mental health being such a like they're so it's so much more positive now, the conversation where you can say that, you know, where years ago, like when we were growing up, you, you so couldn't say that out loud, or it was like, oh my gosh, you know, how is the, the way that the conversations helped help you with, with maybe owning that or being able to like walk that out? And, and how has that changed anything for you? Well, the thing is, is it's always been, or there it was, because now everybody is mental health, get you a therapist, blah, 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 blah. everybody embracing it. Um, today, but before it, it used to be, uh, go to go on the third therapy. You're crazy. Mm -hmm. If you say you need a therapist, if you say you need to go see a psychiatrist, you're crazy. Yeah. Or that's the stigma that will be attached to your name. Yep. So I think um, now I believe that saying that you're going to see a therapist is meaning that you're trying to be healthy, that you're trying to get your mind mentally strong. Um, one of the things that I say when I talk to people or whatever, have conversations, or even when I've had um, talks, when I've given speeches, is that coming out of my depression, I, I had to get spiritual therapy, which means I had to talk to God 
but I had to also have a therapist, yes. a physical person. So there's nothing wrong with, with praying about it because prayer changes things. I fully support prayer and I fully believe that God heals all things and he's all powerful. He is the ultimate healer. However, he also gave therapists the gift to listen, the gift to be impartial and, and to really just allow you to shed some of the layers of the things that may be inside of you and get to the bottom of really why is this happening or why am I like this or whatever. So I... I advocate for therapy. I'm, I'm a mental health advocate. Okay. <laughs> I strongly advocate for um, your mental health. And, and, and again, that's where the positivity comes in. Yes. Speaking positive because I've also had to learn how to take those negative thoughts that often jump into your mind at the oddest times and, and change it into a positive. You have to change that. Um, you can't do that. So I can do all things through Christ. And granted, I took it to a spiritual side. But I can do it. Otherwise, I can do anything I set my mind to. Yes. You know, that's what parents, they pour into their kids. You can do anything you set your mind to. Yeah. You know, what's, what's that realistic goal? <laughs> but that may not mean being a singer when you can't carry a tune. However, you could be a producer for those singers. Yeah. You, you know, I really love that because my, my thing, something that I've said it and I'm really known for is there's things people are praying out that need like medication. And yes. there's things that people are medicating that you just need a good prayer warrior on your side. And exactly. so it's really that knowledge, like even with the essential oils and how I'm really big into them, I tell people like, there's a moment where, you know, where you shifted from like, I have a headache and I can use something to, I, this is a migraine. It needs so much more, you know? Yes. And it's like, you have to use that wisdom. You have to know doctors are there for a reason. Um, I live with Crohn's. I'll be darned if I'm just going to pray about that all the time. Like there comes yeah. a moment where God's like, no, you need to see somebody. You need to make sure you're in the right care. And so while I don't need medication for it, thankfully, I've been able to take care of it with the right supplements and diet. I also know that there's that wisdom of when things start to feel off, that's yeah. why doctors are there. Let's go see the gastroenterologist. Let's make sure everything's okay. And I really think that, um, and I think we're getting better about it as the conversation yeah. becomes better, but there's, you know, for a lot of times people would be like, um, struggling. We had a little girl in my youth group, like she was hearing voices, like mm -hmm. legit voices. And her parents were like, Oh, well, you know, we'll just pray for her. And when it came out one night during a really intense prayer session, um, she started talking about it and she was like, I'm scared. Like, yes. I don't know what I'm going to do. And so we were able to like talk with them and they did get her the help she needed. And she did require hospitalization. And through that, like I've seen her, you know, um, I ended up like, I'm not with that same church anymore. And this is like going back seven, eight years. But from what I've seen, when I see her out, she's like this happy go lucky. Like, I really love what she's turned into. And she like came and saw me at the mall one time. And it's like, purposely came over to like say hi and, and talk and let me know how she was doing. And I was like, I know that that's because she finally got the help she needed. And um, Stephen Furtick even says something in one of his sermons one time, he's like, yeah, I can pray, but sometimes I need like a physical person to talk to. Yeah, like yeah. I need that person on the other side of me like this, because as much as I pray, what I hear still is it has to go through my filter. Yeah. And so if I'm hearing it through like a, uh, like if I'm in a mood where I'm so negative, 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 God could be trying to say anything to me and I'm not going to hear it the same where if I'm sitting there saying yeah. it to you and, and it's, and you, Hey, shell, like, hold on, let's step back. Now I audibly hear that. And I yeah. audibly have to change that. And that's so much better. Um, I love that. So mental health advocate is your profession. No, that's just, oh, okay, okay. It, it, that's just that's just one of the things that I am and I have become because of all the things that I've been through. Okay. So I had to get from that side. I had to, yes. and, and I call depression darkness. Okay. So I had to get out of the darkness and into the light. Yes, and, yes. And, and sometimes you may fall back into the darkness, but you have to know how to pull yourself out of it. Amen. And Amen. Like, again, sometimes it's therapy, sometimes it's prayer, sometimes it's a combination of both. And yeah, you need to know that it's okay not to be okay. Yeah, everything to everybody. Yeah, and, and and you have to know that for yourself. Yes. And that's become so cliche right now, but it's like it really is like take the time to understand those words. Yes. It's okay to not be okay. 
Yeah. Like it is absolutely okay to have a day. Um, one of my friends, Nubia, she's really good about sometimes I just am like, ah, oh, we had plans. I so don't want to people right now, <laughs> you know, and we had one night where like my little girl was teasing us. Like, is this what 40 and 50 looks like mom? Cause we were playing around with zoom and all the different backgrounds and like, we were having a blast, mm -hmm. but it stemmed from I, just neither one of us wanted to go out that night, you know, we had had plans. And so we said, well, let's honor each other with zoom. And it's great having that kind of friendship. And she's a, you know, she's an old newer friend. Like, okay. like we knew each other many years ago and then I moved and now I'm back and we're just yeah. like rekindling that friendship. But mm -hmm. it's great to have that safe space where you can pull, you know, say to a friend like, hey, Disha, I can't tonight after all. Like, I just don't want to people and having a friend who knows like, OK, that's cool. Or like, yeah, that's not cool. How about I just come over and we'll stay in, you know, like having friends who can speak that life and understand like, OK, this is a moment or like, no, this is a real thing. Like, go ahead and be by yourself. But hey, I'm on, you know, standby if it turns into self-harm or something like that. And I think like being able to get that open, sometimes that's been one of our faults almost within the church is like we're afraid to get that honest with people. Yeah. It was only yeah. like up at prayer, right? Transparency is so important. Yes. Not Somebody else's healing may depend on your transparency. And, and that's what we need to see. Because at the end of the day, it's not always about you. That's right. My pastor used to say this to me. I thought, it's not about you. You know, it's, it's not about you. Get out your feelings. <laughs> so much wisdom in what our parents said that we never knew. And so like you're past 40 and you're looking back and you're like, okay, I give it to you. That was like, yeah. And you know, somebody once said, I don't remember who the speaker or the writer was, but there was an author or a preacher who once said that sometimes what you go through is only for someone else, but mm -hmm. God knows that you are strong enough to deal with it. And so like, there's mm -hmm. not a lesson in that breakup for you, but mm -hmm. there is because somebody's watching you go through it, who needs to be breaking up with their person and isn't, but by seeing how you handle it, they can go through it. Or, you know, that single mom who is trying to make their decision and by watching you and how you carry yourself as a single mom, they're able to make, you know, a positive decision or make a different decision than they would have made because they got to see you go through this. Yeah. And those are things that when I heard that, I was like, that's powerful. Because yeah. like, that is like, you know, sometimes you're being like a martyr without knowing it, you know, but then you never know until the end. Of maturity. It takes a level of maturity to be able to see that. Yes. It really yep. does. You have, you have to grow in grace. Yeah. To be able to see that and to, to be able to accept that, that, that cross to carry that cross, that what I'm going through may not be for me. Right. You know, I, I, um, my pastor, I, I think about my pastor and, and my first lady when they went through um, the loss of their children and um, they went through that and they walked through that. They walked faith out. They walked it out in faith, you know, still serving, still showing up uh -huh. and yet going through their own tragedy. You know what I mean? And, and watching it that helps other people or has helped some other people faith grow. Yeah. If they can do that, going through this, who am I to say that I can't deal with this situation? You see what I'm saying? And, and God will use us in that way. There's always somebody watching you, whether you know it or not. There's always somebody watching you. Right. Well, you're watching someone here being like, oh, I wish I was there. There's somebody behind you like, oh, I wish I was there. You know, yeah. like, like how they talk about like you're standing in, in answers to your prayers from the past or somebody answers to somebody else's prayers. And it's like, you know, we almost, um, I think it was, was, I, go to elevation through efam that they're okay, like the okay. church every sunday i'm there and then i have a local church as well that i go to in person okay. but um i think it was stephen furtick or somebody who was a guest speaker there once talked about don't don't wish away what you prayed for mm -hmm. and it was so powerful because it's like you know you get to this space like i think of it in terms of like salaries right that's mm -hmm. where you see it a lot people are like oh i want to make x amount of dollars and i want this job with these benefits and then they get it and like two years later they're like ah, it's not enough i need more you know and and we're so like human we, we god is so patient to deal with us because it's you know or we're like we want the three-bedroom house and we get the three-bedroom and we're like oh but now i work from home and i need an office too oh the five-bedroom would be so much better and you're like seriously like you're living yeah. in what you spent years praying for and crying about i gave it to you and now you want like bigger you know um 
So Disha, I tell me, um, you now have two children and are married? No. I no. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm divorced. <laughs> no, okay. I am as well. Okay. I, I've been, my, I have, I have two children. I have, my son is 32. He's going to kill me. My son is 32. You don't look old enough. And I have two grandchildren. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Nice. I would not have guessed that. <laughs> yeah, but I, okay. And, and let me circle back for a minute. I, um, when sure. you said um, how you had um, had to go back home at 38. Yeah. So when my, I got the, my, my, had my daughter, I got the worst of my daughter was like a still a baby. Okay. Stay so here. I had to leave my husband and come home. I had to start over again. I have, let me tell you something. I thank God that I'm a humble person. I've never been a person that really cares what nobody thinks. I had to come home with two kids and sleep in the bed with my grandmother. Me and my wow. husband and my baby slept together. Wow. <laughs> See, and that's where I'm saying like you're where someone prayed for, right? Because I'm in like the master bedroom of the house. Like I'm meeting with you in a corner of the room that's like big enough to be an office. And then like there's still like this whole thing over there that could be like a studio. And wow. I'll be like, I want my own place because I can't have friends over. You know, and it's like I know my parents are so tired of me because I'm like, I'm 44, my room's clean, my chores are done, I still can't play with anybody, you know. <laughs> and you know, it's like not true to the real point, but it's like, you know, it's their yeah. home not my yeah. space yeah. and well, after well, having like, nothing like your own though it's yeah nothing, it really it's is in your own space yeah and what's That's crazy it. is through the purpose in my pain and the obedience and writing that I was offered an apartment for like this amazing um rate and everything and Saturday I went over to look at it and God just said, no, like it was almost this Hannah moment. And I, uh, prophetess Elisa, they yeah. had prayed about this and I was listening back and yeah. I'm just like, I still am kind of, you know, going through it. So, but I'm just like, I, it was like, almost like this Hannah, like I, six years I have prayed. It was perfect. And when we went, it, it wasn't perfect. And it was like, no, this is settling. And mm -hmm. God didn't say settle. God did not right. say settle. And so I was like, wrestling in that like god okay is this me being spoiled of like no i want two bedrooms and two bathrooms minimum or is this me like am i hearing you and so i had to come home and wrestle and like all saturday i was a mess like crying <laughs> but it is that moment of like you know we we are we're spoiled because sometimes i look at it and like where i'm like oh woe is me somebody else would be like hey you know like i was sleeping with my grandmother and my child appreciate yeah. that you're in your own you know yeah. and so I, what I love though, is, is how God never lets anything go without purpose because yeah. I'm in the childhood home that I was removed from mm -hmm. as a teenager and then have come back willingly, you yeah. know, that the very people that, um, it didn't feel loved by now. There's so much love and the way our family, like my little nephew and niece, oh my gosh, I'm getting to see them grow up. You know, he was born when we moved to Florida and it was after we came back from Florida. I didn't want to move back to the house that I was abused in. And so my house was on the market and I chose to move in here. And it was, um, two months after I said yes to, to moving in here that God sold, like my house ended up selling. And so I was just like, and it was on the market the whole time we lived in Florida and did not move, no buyers, no potential, nothing. And mm -hmm. so I knew it was a God thing. And I, I think it's part of that, like healing in the place where you were hurt, yeah. you know, yeah. healing in that place where like, you have to be able to look, my daughter sleeps in the room that I can remember tears, you know, and, and remember things happening. And it was just like, oh my gosh. And yet she has this wonderful experience. You know, yeah. she gets to be in a house with people who love her. My parents love her to death and like just so much, you know, it, so thank you for that, that, that because it is something and it's, it, you know, it's interesting too. I love how God brings people together. Like we have so much in common. Um, mm -hmm. I was going to go into the army after high school, but mm -hmm. my thing was because of the, the relationship with my folks at that time in my life, I didn't have anyone to sign her over. So I was going to go to West Point. I had taken the ASVAB. I was like ready to become a JAG. I was so excited. That was going to be my life. And then they said, but you have to sign custody over because if something happens at boot camp. And I was like, no, I got guardianship. Like I had guardianship all worked out with the lady who did her daycare. Everything was ready. And they were like, no, it had to be custody. And I was like, yeah. 
what is that? And I guess it had changed like desert storm time frame, where right. I was still going off of when it, I think it was like ROTC or something it was called, like where you get to do all the PT with the guys and, yeah. you know, do your exercises and prepare. So it's funny how we have like that in common, but you actually did get to go in and yeah. then um, going through like the divorce, you know, I was 30, 31 when it went through 30, when he left 31, when it went through and just going back through that experience, but I wouldn't change it. You know, yeah. if I had to go back and do it all again, I would live it. I would just do it with a better attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'd have that knowledge of like God's working stuff out here, you know? And again, I am always amazed like people who, when I, when I'm off Facebook for a little while, yeah. people will be like, Hey, I've really missed your inspiration like seeing how you handle. And it's like people that I'm like, I didn't even know you paid attention. Yeah. They might, you know? they might, they might not like yeah. it. They might not put a like on there, but they're watching it. You yeah. know, you might put a post up and you don't get one like on it. But when you don't put a post up, somebody's commented that, Oh, we missed you or we didn't see you or something like that. Somebody's right. Watching. Right. Oh. And you never know who is. Um, Wild Contagious Hope is her handle. Her name's Amber. So uh -huh. on Instagram, she goes by Wild Contagious Hope. And she did a video yesterday, I believe it was, where she was saying, like, you don't know when you're entertaining angels. Like, yes. you have a, no idea who's in our presence. And there are times that what you're going through, I think of when I went to visit Florida. And we were moving down there on a word from God. We wanted to be part of racial reconciliation after Trayvon Martin and everything had happened at Sanford, which is having a lot of racial wars and, and things were not good, you know, with everything down there. And we felt a call to go and like God provided everything, like just the money to get down there, the house down there, just a, we had this like a year away from life almost, even though we were very much in life with the reality of, of what things were like down there. But mm -hmm. I think of um, this woman I met when I was visiting I was on an advance they called it instead of you know retreat they called it in advance and I was down there and I went to go visit the house and while there I decided to walk down the street to this um Eustace Park mm -hmm. and this old lady was there like gosh, probably 80 90 years old and she just talking to me and we start talking and, um, you know, I had gone through the divorce and now here I was like, I had just started my business and I was like happy that I was on my feet and, you know, I'm going to beat this. Like I said, I'm going to beat the statistics and not be like a divorced woman, yada, yada. Yeah. And she started sharing with me about what, you know, her husband passing away and things she had learned along the way and how she had to stand on her own as a single lady and don't jump and don't rush into relationships and love this time and just listen to what God has. And I remember going back after I moved down there like several weeks just wanting to see her the conversation was just so good and so filled my heart and I'm like she was an angel yes. I really believe that she just she had told me she always came there and yet when I would ask about her nobody else had ever seen her and yes. like it was so crazy and I'm like you know Lord I would not yes. be surprised like she just needed to let me know like this isn't crazy it feels crazy that in two months you've just changed the whole trajectory of your life but it's, you need to do this. And we loved it down there. It was so everything we needed to fill us up. So have you ever had an experience like that where like you just, there was like a trajectory change and, and you realized like, oh man, this is crazy, but yet it's completely sane. <laughs> like, this is what I'm supposed to do. I, I just think, I don't know if I had it like that. Okay. I, what I do think is I do think that God places people in your life. Mm. Yes. Um, God might send you a word through a perfect stranger. Yeah. And I do believe there are angels. And I also believe that God has us on his heart all the time. Yes. So, and I know there's times when we don't feel like it. We don't hear his voice. So we don't feel like he's present, but he's always present. And, and I say that because I realize now that I'm looking back over my life, I, I sound like I'm so old at this point. <laughs> but as I look back over my life, I realized that he always covered me, that even in my darkness, he covered me. And the times when I felt like I didn't want to be here no more, he covered me. And um, even with my daughter, like there was a time when she was a baby, I just didn't want to live anymore. I literally put her in her swing. I went up, she was a good, she used to be, she was a, such a good baby, not really cried. And I went upstairs and I said, okay, I'm about to take these pills. I'm done. I don't feel like this no more. And she started yelling and screaming like a banshee. Uh, the good baby. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I had no choice but to go see what's wrong with her. Because she don't do that. You know, mm-hmm. and, and that was God saying, girl, don't even try it. No, you're not doing this, not today. <laughs> uh, and you does know? she know that story? I don't think I ever shared it with her like that. And when I, I think I might have said something, but she don't realize what I'm saying. I don't the power it. of it. Um, okay. But I, I really believe God used her in that way. And, and yeah. I see over the course of my life, so many times when God sent just what I needed. It, right. I, I'm divorced. Like I said, I got divorced from my daughter's baby, but it took me until darn near basically she was an adult for me to really deal with that. Okay. Um, I had to one day lay on the floor in a hotel with me and God and scream out to him uh-huh. to truly walk into healing. Yes. To really walk into healing. And so I think that he uses people in various ways. He used her going to college to, to make me face myself. Uh-huh. I had lost myself. I, I, I didn't know all, all of the pain and all the things I had put into the, my subconscious mind began to flood back when she was gone because now I didn't have none of, no children to focus on. Yeah, there's no distraction now. It was just me. It was just me. Wow. And so that's, that's where the therapy, that's how I knew I needed a real a therapist there. <laughs> you wow. know? So it was at that point when she went to college that everything came back okay. to my brain. And I had to deal with it and I had to deal with me. And and this the crazy thing is, I don't know, I don't know if you've ever been like this. Somebody asked me what my therapist is. Well, what do you like to do? I said, I don't know. Like, what, what do you like? I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what Disha likes. That's a hard thing to learn, you know, and sorry, I fidget so much. <laughs> I was talking with Dr. Hall about that. Like I could never blur out the background because I yeah. move way too much. But, um, you know, I, I think that's such an important point of like not knowing who we are. And so right. as a prior domestic violence victim and as an abuse survivor, my whole life was masks and avoiding the truth because that meant having to tell someone what was happening. And I didn't want to do that. You know, I willingly married this man knowing he wasn't Christian and I was. I willingly went into this at 20 thinking like he was the solution to every problem I had. And and I knew like, you know, I, I, I have a journal entry I wrote the night before I got married. And mm-hmm. I wrote, this man is going to break me in ways that I never understood brokenness. Oh, wow. Like, I mean, I knew, Deja, I knew God. You know, you manifested that, right? And ten, I, you part of it may have been self fulfilling prophecy, and the other part may have been God showing me, like you still have an out, you haven't said I do yet. Yeah. I don't know because I was a very baby Christian at that time, yeah. and my, you know, like um, I talk about how I knew him as savior. Okay. From at 18, I got saved when my daughter was in my belly. I was six months pregnant, got saved thanks to Christopher Williams, a substitute at my school, who was just okay. like, got fed up with me one day coming in high while well pregnant. Like I was not at all a good person. And he just got so frustrated. And he and I are never without words ever. He was a preacher and I'm like the girl who can talk about anything. And we just got like to a point where the, it was like, blah, 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 and he was like, you need Jesus. And I was like, fine. And he was like, then come to church. And I was like, then take me, you know, like it was that simple. And I went and I just, oh my gosh, I loved it. It was this Baptist church up in Rhode Island, um, Pleasant Street Baptist. They loved on me. I mean, I can remember going in, we don't have this stuff happen anymore. We need to get back to this kind of church. Um, mm-hmm. I remember going in one Sunday and and like, you know, I talk about how I would literally still go in with blood from the night before on me. Like, yeah. like I would go in that church broken high, like not in a good spot yeah. and they didn't judge. And I remember one time, Miss Margareta, um, I walked in and I was hurting that day. You know, there had been some bad stuff that happened. I, I didn't need a sermon. I needed a message. Yeah. And she looked at me when I walked through those doors and she was like, how are you? And you know what we do? No, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. I was so glad to be blessed and highly favored. You know, I'm the head, not the tail, right? Like those things that don't mean anything, like when you're not yet to the place of affirmation, but it's that cognitive dissonance that you're saying. And she looked at me and she goes, oh no, oh no, 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 no. And she brought me downstairs and she spent that whole time praying over me, talking with me. And that was my message that day. And Mm -hmm. so I fell in love with him as savior right away. Like there was no doubt. I knew that this man had died for me. I've never question that, but I didn't know him as Lord until I turned 25. 
okay, it took okay. eight years of like about eight years of playing Christianity tiptoeing mm-hmm. because I still wasn't worthy you know like living with the shame and the guilt and the the life history but then one day it just clicked like he chose me yeah you know, we are a chosen people a royal priesthood yeah and that means me like yeah. that was mind-blowing and ever since then I haven't looked back like it has been gung-ho not gonna say I haven't had moments where I've fallen and made some stupid decisions but I my heart has been in the right place and I'm working through and they're fewer and further between you know my mouth still can get the best of me especially during driving um but but it's like (laughs) every time I drive I tell my daughter like listen the day that I can make a trip and there's none of this I promise you Jesus is coming that night. Like I promise you say, get right with him because it's just, boy, I get behind that car and it's like, Lord, (laughs) instead of asking him to take the wheel, I'm like, Lord, please just don't, don't be in the car. (laughs) So, but you know, I think like there's this, this thing about like, he brings people with us. And then there's also that defining of that question, who I am is almost like this eternal, eternal. It's funny that God's first question to us is where are you? Mm -hmm. and yet we spend our whole lives saying who am I yeah right I never thought about that so wild wow he was thinking about location and what we were doing and did we understand and we spend our whole time like who am I like we're the only creation formed with his hands and like that he looked at and was like just in love with from the moment he saw it and like it's wild to me. And yet we spend there and we, we like downplay ourselves and we, we don't think we're perfect or we don't look like something. Um, you know, I love that like today's kids don't have, like we grew up with, um, and I know like the white experience might be, so I do, I understand the disclaimer. I'm so about to say all oh, white blonde haired models, but it was like Cindy Crawford, Nikki Clark, like, you know, that was like my model. Tyra Banks came along a little later and I couldn't name another like African-American. Like I can't even imagine what my friends were African-American. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. But, but look at, we're struggling to name more than that from the eighties and nineties. Like, you know, I love that today my daughter can look around and they're not all white blonde hair, stick figure moles. Mm -hmm. I'm Vicki Clark and Cindy Crawford both have a mole. Like, like that was the image. And so when you didn't live up to it, it brought on all this pain. And so like, you know, my, my 27 year old, she grew up with me, like, oh my God, I'd be like 105 pounds and still not, not happy. You know, where my youngest daughter now is growing up. I'm not going to say I'm like, oh, you sexy mama, but I'm at the same time, I'm not putting myself down as much. You know, I'm owning that, like, this is what I am and I can change it by doing certain lifestyle changes. But right now I like the way that I'm living. And so I, this is what I'm choosing to make time for. Mm -hmm. And I love that they have more images in front of them of what like positive looks like, what sexy looks like, what, and that can go a whole other way too. But you know, like they have so many different, you know, there's um, plus sizes and minus sizes. (laughs) Right. And different skin complexions. And I love it. So you have like all these different role models. And so when we're thinking about that, who am I question, I think we grew up like comparing that. And I like that today they have like, as they're comparing, who am I, they can either get swept up in the noise and and we can get lost in that same noise because we have those same amount of of influences open to us now, or we can hear like truly like, okay, God, there's a variety of what, who am I looks like. So show me personally, like, like come in and let's sit and go through like, am I funny or am I not? Because yeah. it's okay to be both, right? I have a girlfriend who's so dry that when she makes a joke, it's hilarious because you're like, whoa, where did that come from? You yeah. know, where for me, like I did a photo shoot um, in May of 2020 and mm-hmm. Shao, when she caught like all of my um, expressions, Disha, it was crazy. I like, like I have, I'm like, did I ever like actually smile or is it just a bunch oh, of wow. laughter? Because yeah. I like, I'm in various stages of like laughing and like, Like, I just, I never realized how expressive I am, but that's part of my character. And then you get to that, even like that deeper level of like, I am loved, I am chosen, I am called, um, getting to the characteristics of like, I'm a writer, I'm a poet, 
I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, you know, I love um, when there's that whole exploration of the who am I where it's like, you'll answer it. And it's like, no, not what you do. No, I'm not asking like what role you play. I'm not asking about your hobby. Who are you? And that can only be answered by the one who made us, you know, having that, that heart to heart with him now. So I just spoke like a whole lot right there. Mm -hmm. Where are you at in that process now? You know, so, so you're on this side of it. Um, Do you feel like you have a better understanding of that now, or is this still an exploration you're going through? Well, I think I have a better understanding of who I am. Okay. I know who I am to God. Yeah. It helps me to know who I am to me because okay. I am the child. I am the child of the king. Yeah. And, and everything that he has belongs to me. I am I inherit that. There's legacy here. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And it, it, it took a long time to be able to look in the mirror and say, I matter. You know what I mean? I'm worthy. I am loved. Because there was a, there's a whole lot of other, you're not loved, you don't feel loved, you weren't always treated as if you were loved. And, mm-hmm. and what I had to figure out is that true love comes from within. I'm, I, maybe I'm not those things because I didn't love myself, mm-hmm. you know? And, yeah. and so you had, to, you had to come to the realization that you have to love yourself first. Because how can you truly love anyone else right. if you don't love yourself? Other than your children, because that that un- unconditional agape love that you got for your kids, the way God mm-hmm. loves us, that goes from you to your kids. But outside of that, all the other people, you know, and it's not what people think of you or what people say to you, but what do you say to yourself that yes. really matters? You know, you're not here to please people. Or is what you're doing pleasing to God? Mm. That's the only one I, I care about. I, I really don't care what men think no more. And before it was, I, I was a people pleaser, you know, and and, and, and and tried to be everything to everybody. But I finally learned how to say no. And, and That's I, a I whole really other conversation. To choose me. So to choose good. Me. Yes. Our young man used to do the thing, heal yourself, you know. Yes. <laughs> you know, and I had to I had to get to that point. And, and I believe that I'm, I'm in such a better place now. You know, and, and there's a song that um, leads the Clark sisters, or um, one of them says, speak over yourself. Speak yes. Over yourself, you know, and so I, I really, I, I think that, I, be, I don't think, I know that I am in a much better place than before. I see light instead of darkness. The cup is half full and not half empty. You know what I mean? I walk a little straighter. I talk a little bolder. And, and that's because I know who my father is and therefore I know who I am. So yes, I'm, I'm definitely on the other side. I have no intentions of going back. Amen, I'm amen. And highly favored and out here trusting God, okay? <laughs> I love that. And so a quick note and we'll, and we'll kind of wrap this up. So so one thing as you were saying that, um, Crystal Livingston is a singer, a gospel singer, and she has this song, Shoelaces, off her first oh, yeah. album. And the chorus is, um, the only time I look down now is when I tie my shoelaces. Oh, um, okay. I'll send it I'll send it to you in Messenger afterwards, and I'll put a link for those of you watching this um, down in the um, YouTube descriptor and in the blog so that song just take a listen if I love it it's like on the other side of like that you know god esteem so to say and then the other thing I think about is um you were saying like choosing yourself and I know that can be a whole other segment and maybe we'll do that sometime we'll talk about it but but the quick nutshell here is I think that is so important it is okay to say no to everybody else it is okay to have a season where the only person you attend to is yourself granted if you're a parent you got to make sure your kids needs you know I'm not advocating for like abusing kids and neglecting them what I'm saying is there are times that your ministry is to yourself Yes. You need that. And that was such a hard lesson for me, like you, people pleaser. But I did a year, um, 2020 was my year of yes. Um, it was based on Shonda Rhimes did that book on her year of yes. And in learning how to say yes, I learned how to say no. And what it was is like her sister had challenged her that she always said no to things, always said no, always said no. And so for one year, she had to say yes to everything. And so using that, like God had put the word yes as my word of the year. And then I came across her book and I was like, this year, I'm not going to say no 
to any idea that comes into my mind. Cause I'm really good about like, is that God or is that me? You know, like overanalyzing. I'm like the queen of overthinkers anonymous, you know, like president and every member in the group. Um, and so I, I was like this year, just if I think it, I'm doing it. Okay. And what I ended up learning when I got to the end of the year and I was journaling on the reflection was that because I said yes, I had to say no to other things. And like Lisa Turkhurst, if you're more of like into her, um, she has uh, your best yes. I believe it's Lisa Turkhurst. I might've quoted that author wrong, but she has like, you know, your best yes. And that's what you learn is that by saying yes here, I have to say no to this other thing. And that's okay. That's an okay thing to do. So I love that you said like, I chose me. Yeah. Because that's such a place that if we all got to that place that we chose ourselves and we all got to that place, um, when you said about like, I had to love myself, mm-hmm. there's a line I yeah. have in my it, the in smoke and word poem that I have called see me. And it talks about like, um, it is said that to love others, you have to love yourself. But I call BS on that because I haven't loved myself for years. And mm-hmm. And at the time that was 2015, 2016, I wrote that. Mm -hmm. I really believed that at that moment, I believed like, I don't have to love myself because I can't, I'm loving others though. Great. But after the journey of like falling in love with somebody, learning what true, like, godly love looked like okay. and 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 it's not about romantic feelings it's about like I love you Disha whether you are loving me whether you are hating me whether you are honoring me whether you're not honoring what because you are a child of God and I am a child of God and we're walking this life together learning that kind of love all of a sudden you realize like you can't do that until you love yourself yeah. because if I can't give myself grace to choose me how do I choose you I'm yeah. not really doing that. I'm I'm appeasing you, right? The people pleasing side, or I'm using you because I see something you have that I want. And so I love, there's so much to that. I, I, we'll unpack that maybe in a blog post or in a future conversation, but um, I'm going to leave y'all hanging there because that there's so much meat in that. But any, yeah. so, so you, we have the poetry book one more time. Um, you said inner sanctum. It's, um, it's Inner Sanctum, Life, Love, and Poetry, and it's not published under Disha Hensfield. It's okay. published under Noah's sister. It's N-O-I-R-E-S-I-S-T-A. Okay. And it's available on Amazon. Perfect. I'll put a link to that in the blog post because this will go up on the Essential Creative, and then I'll also share it in the YouTube um, where it will go live as well. And they can also find you as an author in the purpose of my pain. I'm so happy yes. to like have my hardcover. I'm just like show it in everything. Like, yes. <laughs> she's a great job on that. Um, and her chapter is called I am by Disha Henfield. How can people find you if they would like to find you? Um, I am Disha Henfield, which is D-E-S-H-A, um, H-E-N-F-I-E-L-D on Facebook and on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I mean, otherwise you could just, email me and that's my email as well with Disha Hinfield at outlook.com <laughs> and um I also have a page on Facebook and it's under Nora sister n-o-i-r-e-s-i-s-t-a and Perfect. so you can also find me on that page and therefore you can DM me in any of those places if you wanted to contact me for anything Excellent. So go to Amazon, get the poetry book. If you're a poetry fan, if you're not a poetry fan, maybe buy it and give it to somebody you think might be. Um, I will share my favorite poem after I read it. So you guys can look for a blog post on that um, because I love poetry. So I'm looking forward to buying that book and supporting you. Tisha, thank you so much for doing this. You know, it's it's great. Like we got to see each other on the different calls and everything and, and be in the chat, but this was nice to actually get a chance to get to know you tonight. And so I appreciate you taking time and opening your world to those of us in the essential creative community. Thank you. I really appreciate you giving me this platform and giving me your time. And find out we have so much in common. I know. It's crazy. (laughs) I look forward to our friendship blooming, you know, and seeing like outside of this space. So thank you so much. I will, um, this will be up soon for everyone to watch. And if you're already watching it, then it's already up. So thanks everyone for tuning in. Have a great night.